Uh, my name is Rebecca Bowling, and I am the director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities. Um, and this is our second Humanities Forum event of the semester. And it is a real pleasure to have the Corinman Lecture be part of the Humanities Forum this semester. Um, and my role is simply to be able to introduce you to you Dr. Carol McCann, who is of course the Director of Gender and Women's Studies, and who will be directing our speaker, uh, introducing our speaker. But before I do that, I just want to tell you about our next Humanities Forum event, which is coming up next Wednesday, the 7th. And it is connected to a wonderful exhibit, if you've had a chance to already see it, down in the library gallery. And this is The Passage on the Underground Railroad. And the name of the talk is Passage on the Underground Railroad and the Black Experience Within American History. The photographer and artist who will be our speaker is Stephen Mark. Um, and it's really a wonderful um, exhibit. So please take this opportunity maybe during the course of the week and go see it so that you're prepared for next week's talk. So with no further ado, Dr. Carol McCann. Good afternoon and welcome. Um, I want to extend a um, welcome on behalf of the core faculty of Gender and Women's Studies and the members of the Coordinating Committee. Um, this is our fifth annual Corinman Lecture. And before I introduce the speaker, I need to extend thanks to our many co-sponsors for their support of today's lecture. And they include the Office of the Provost, uh, the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Science, the Drescher Center for the Humanities and the Humanities Forum, as well as the Honors College, and then the Departments of American Studies, English, Modern Language and Linguistics, and Intercultural Communication, uh, Psychology, Sociology, and Anthropology, and the uh, Language, Literacy, and Culture Program, as well as University Health Services and the Women's Center. Um, I also want to thank the students of the Gender and Women's Studies community um, who have helped with the logistics today, but most importantly, I want to thank the staff in Gender and Women's Studies, Elle Trues, the our GAs, Teresa Foster and Emmett Ergen, and most importantly, um, Chelsea Hathaway-Williams at OIA for their uh, work in preparation for today's lecture. We're also very lucky this afternoon that Dr. Joan Corman is with us. Um, Joan is the first director of the uh, Women's Studies at UMBC, for whom this uh, lecture is named. She's also the founder and moderator of WOMSTEL, which I hope many of you know, uh, which since 1990 has supported a vibrant transnational online women's studies community. So welcome, Joan. Uh, the Corinman Lecture is a series in which we seek to highlight the wealth of contemporary scholarship being produced at the intersections of gender and women's studies and other academic disciplines. This year, however, is a little bit different. Um, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the founding of women's studies program at UMBC. Uh, and the program owes a debt um, to faculty like Joan um, and Angela Morjani and Daphne Harrison, who convinced um, somewhat skeptical colleagues that this new field, women's studies, was worth the university's investments. Um, and in the years since its founding, the program has become a vital intellectual community that supports faculty, student, and staff whose work focuses on issues of women, gender, and sexuality. And more importantly, the uh, program governance structure has become a model for other interdisciplinary programs at UMBC. With that history in mind, we decided this year to invite someone whose work is situated at the center of women's studies. Someone whose work exemplifies the field's commitments to publicly engaged, interdisciplinary, and intellectually rigorous scholarship. Therefore, we invited Dr. Kathy Davis to present this year's Corinman Lecture. Dr. Davis is senior researcher at the Institute of History and Culture at Berkchick. Oh, I did that wrong, I'm sorry, Marilyn. Um, Ertrich uh, University in the Netherlands. Uh, she is the current co-editor of the European Journal of Women's Studies, the author of four books and editor of four anthologies, including the very influential handbook on gender and women's studies published by Sage Press in 2006. 
The handbook provides a thorough update of the central issues in the discipline, making it a really wonderful tool for those of us who are working in the field and trying to imagine the next generation of women's studies curriculum. Much of her own scholarship focuses on issues of women's bodies and health, including research on doctor-patient interactions, beauty practices, and the ethics of surgical technologies. Her best known work is the 2007 book, The Making of Our Bodies Ourselves, How Feminism Travels Across Borders, and there are books for sale around the corner if you are interested. Um, reviewers have described the book as an exceptional book on an exceptional feminist project and we, which each chapter is a gem of information and insightful analysis that is both theoretically sophisticated and very accessible. That's all quotations. Um, as many of you know, the book Our Bodies Ourselves is a feminist icon. It challenged medical dogma about women's bodies and sexuality, influencing how generations of US women think about their bodies, health, and sexuality and it empowered them to, de to demand better health, medical care. In this way, Our Bodies Ourselves helped to influence medical practice and healthcare policies. And in the first section of Dr. Davis's book, she explores that history. However, as she worked on the project, she found that the book had a whole life outside the United States. It has been taken up Translated, adapted by women across the globe, inspiring more than 30 foreign language editions. And therefore, she expanded her research to include the story of this global circulation of our bodies ourselves as well. Among Dr. Davis's achievements in the book is, and I'm quoting again from a reviewer, that she brilliantly brings together the debates on contemporary body theory with women's health activism which two debates which are often very divorced and disconnected from each other. By reading the various versions of Our Bodies Ourselves, reading letters to the editors from readers, talking with the original editors, with translators, she traces how the book invites readers to use their own experiences as resources for producing situated critical knowledge. And in so doing, she makes a cogent case for Our Bodies Ourselves as an example of feminist embodied experiential knowledge building. At the same time, by situating the history of our body as ourselves and its relationship with readers within an account of the book's travels and translations, she succeeds in decentering the book as a U.S. project. Um, her, analysis, her analysis helps us think in more complicated ways about women's bodies, feminist knowledge building, and transnational feminist community. As a whole, this excellent book makes substantial contributions to the history of women's health movements, to feminist body theory, to reader response theory, and to transnational feminist theory and politics. The interdisciplinary breadth of the book is, uh, is uh, evidenced by the fact that it has received prizes in several disciplines, including the Distinguished Book Prize from the American Sociological Association section on sex and gender, the Eileen Basker Prize from the American Anthropological Association, and the Joan Kelly Prize for Women's History from the American Historical Association. Drawing on her research on the global travels of our bodies ourselves, Dr. Davis today will talk about feminism and traveling theory. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathy Davis. very much for that wonderful introduction and um, I'd like to say that I'm absolutely delighted to, to be here uh, today. I want to particularly thank um, Carol McCann for the invitation. I've already had a wonderful time here um, also talking to some of you uh, before the lecture. Um, so I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about the book, um, uh, well, the book Our Bodies Ourselves, but also the book I wrote about the book. Um, Maybe to start off, I should say that this was far and away the most difficult um, book that I ever wrote. It also took me longer than any other book I ever wrote, but at the same time, it was the most rewarding book I ever wrote. <laughs> um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about, um, um, well, I'll, I'll start by telling you a little bit about um, Our Bodies, Ourselves, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the his, uh, its history in the United States, and then I'll go on to tell you about how it 
traveled and um, some of the implications that I think this travel has for how we think about um, the history of feminism, for how we think about um, uh, feminist knowledge and knowledge practices, and for how we think about the possibilities but also the pitfalls of uh, transnational feminist politics. So let me see first if I can get this up and okay. The story begins in 1969 when a group of US women met in Boston at one of the first conferences of second wave feminism in a workshop called Women and Their Bodies. Some of them had already been active in the civil rights movement or had helped draft resistors during the Vietnam War. But this was, for many of them, their first encounter with feminism. They talked about their sexuality, which was still very much taboo. They, they talked about abortion, which was at that time illegal. They talked about their experiences with pregnancy and childbirth. And they talked about their frustrations with physicians and healthcare. The group later evolved into the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. So here you see a very iconic picture that was taken in 1971. You can see them with their long flowing hair and long flowing skirts. This group began to meet regularly. They collected information about health issues which was at that time, unlike today, uh, scarce and hard to find. And I think that's important to realize that today when, when so much information is available on the internet, at that, at that time, uh, this wasn't the case. So this was quite a, a revolutionary act. They began to write papers, which they then discussed with women in groups. A year later, they assembled all these papers elaborated with the personal experiences of the women who had attended the groups and put a cover on them, and the first version of Our Bodies Ourselves was born. So here you can see a photograph. I used to bring my own uh, edition of this first uh, Our Bodies Ourselves, but it's uh, really a historical document at this point, so it's kind of crumbling. <laughs> um, so now you have a photograph. Um, originally printed on newsprint, by an underground publisher and selling for 40 cents, Our Bodies Ourselves was a lively and accessible manual on women's bodies and health. It was full of personal stories and contained useful information on issues ranging from masturbation, how to do it, to birth control, troll, where to get it, to vaginal infections, pregnancy, and childbirth. It combined a scathing critique of patriarchal medicine and the medicalization of women's bodies with an analysis of the political e economics of the healthcare system and the pharmaceutical industry. But the trademark of our bodies ourselves was its validation of women's embodied experience as a resource for challenging medical and cultural dogmas about women's bodies and its insistence on the importance of critical knowledge politics for women's personal and collective empowerment. The book was an overnight success, somewhat to the surprise of its authors. Since the first edition, of uh, the first edition in 1971, Our Bodies Ourselves has sold over four million copies in the United States alone and gone through 13 major updates. Here is the latest Our Bodies, Ourselves, which came out last year in 2011. So as you can see, there's a lot of water under that bridge. Often called the Bible of women's health, Our Bodies, Ourselves has shaped how generations of women have felt about their bodies, their sexuality and relationships, their reproduction and health. It was popular enough to occupy the New York Times bestseller list for several years. It has received worldwide <coughs> critical acclaim, but it also evoked controversy. In 1980, it was banned from school libraries by the moral majority, who called it, and I quote, obscene trash and humanistic garbage. 
Ironically, in the very same year, it was voted best young adult book by the American Library Association. <laughs> Our Bodies Ourselves routinely appears on reading lists for women's studies courses across the country, and also um, right here, as I heard today. Um, and it has been cited in 1996 by contemporary sociology as one of the most influential publications of the last 25 years. Interestingly, along with such lofty scholarly masterpieces as Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punish, Edward Said's Orientalism, and Emmanuel Wallerstein's The Modern World System. In addition to its popularity, and I know of no other equivalent feminist book, Our Bodies Ourselves has transformed the provision of health care, helped shape health care policies, and stimulated research on women's health. No family practice is complete without a copy of Our Bodies Ourselves in the waiting room. Gynecological examinations have now become more responsive to patients' needs because of our bodies ourselves. Hospital births have been humanized by birthing rooms and practices which give women more control of, over the process of giving birth because of our bodies ourselves. Our bodies ourselves encouraged many women to enter medicine and helped rehabilitate midwifery as a respectable healthcare profession. It has been a catalyst for consumer and patient advocate organizations in the United States, and it has contributed to many campaigns for women's reproductive rights. It was instrumental in giving patient information and in getting patient information inserts packaged with medications, and it has played an advocacy role in con congressional hearings and scientific conferences on the safety of medications, medical devices, and procedures ranging from silicone breast implants to Depo Provera to the new genetic technologies. When I began my, re my, my research, my initial intention was to write a collective oral history of our bodies ourselves based on the memories of its founders. I wanted to use this history to help explain the enormous social impact of our bodies ourselves in the United States and its cultural significance as a feminist icon. However, as many of you know, things do not always turn out as you expect them to. In the course of doing this research, I made a rather momentous discovery, was my eureka moment, which completely changed the focus of my project. I had not been aware that Our Bodies Ourselves had not only been popular in the United States, it had a whole life outside the United States as well. I found out that it had been taken up, translated, adapted, and disseminated by local groups of feminist health activists across the globe. There are now over 30 foreign language editions of Our Bodies Ourselves, and the end is nowhere in sight which is one reason that I'm glad I finished my book. <laughs> Our Bodies Ourselves has not only been a success in the United States, you could say that Our Bodies Ourselves has been US feminism's most popular export. This international trajectory convinced me that a history which centered on Our Bodies Ourselves in the United States could not begin to do justice to the impact of the book. But more importantly, the travels of our bodies ourselves raised questions which were irresistibly intriguing, certainly for a feminist scholar like myself. First of all, how could a feminist book on women's health, written by a group of lay women, have such an impact within and outside the United States? And how could such a distinctively US American book resonate with women in such diverse and different social, cultural, and geographical locations? And what happened to the book when it traveled? How did it change in order to address the concerns of women in such different contexts? And what does this say about how feminist knowledge circulates transnationally? Answering these questions became the new focus of my book. Today, I can only give you a glimpse of what I discovered. I'm going to explain briefly how our bodies ourselves could travel as it did, 
give you a few translation stories as examples of how it changed in the course of its travels, and then move on to how my research on our bodies ourselves has changed my thinking, not only about how feminist theory, uh, how feminist history should be written, but also on feminism as a traveling theory and as a transnational political practice. So let me start by showing you a map. Okay, this map will give you an idea of how Our Bodies Ourselves started its travels. As you can see, it first appeared in most Western European countries in the, in the 70s and early 80s. The first appeared in Italy in 1974, in Denmark, in Spain, in France in 1977, in the United Kingdom, an adaptation for the United Kingdom in 1978, the Greek Our Bodies Ourselves, Our Bodies Ourselves in Swedish, the German Our Bodies Ourselves, which appeared in 1980 and for some reason in two, uh, two volumes. <laughs> the Dutch version of Our Bodies Ourselves, which has um, arguably the most uh, boring cover. <laughs> it was also published in Japan in 1975 and later <coughs> updated in 1988. And a pirated edition appeared in Taiwan. There's an interesting story behind this. This is one of the early editions which was actually taken on by the publisher, actually stolen by the publisher without any contact with uh, the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, and they were extremely uh, disconcerted to see the, the cover <laughs> of the book, not to mention what was left out. <laughs> by, the, by the 1980s, Our Bodies Ourselves had started to move south and east. It was adapted and, and or translated in Arabic, in Egypt in 1991, and in Hebrew for Israel. It was translated into Russian in 1995, and later went out of print and was taken up again and adapted and published by a feminist group in St. Petersburg in 2007. It was adapted for South Africa in 1996. In India, a translation was made in Telugu in 1991, and it went on to become a landmark feminist book going through many reprintings. Twelve years later, it was adapted and published in English for an Indian audience under a new title, Taking Charge of Our Bodies. In 2000, a new Spanish adaptation was published for the United States and Latin America, Nuestros Cuerpos, Nuestras Vidas. By the 1990s, Our Bodies Ourselves had made major inroads in Central and Southeast Asia and Africa. In 2005, a French Notre Corp, sorry, Notre Center for Francophone Africa appeared. Most Eastern European countries have their own Our Bodies Ourselves now. For Serbia, um, uh, published in 2001, a Bulgarian Our Bodies Ourselves, published in 2001, a Romanian version for Moldova, and a Polish version, which was published in 2004. Our Bodies Ourselves has also been translated into the Thai language, 
in Mandarin Chinese, and in Armenian. And Our Bodies, Ourselves for South Korea appeared in 2005, followed by Tibetan and Albanian versions. A multi-language Our Bodies, Ourselves in pamphlet form for Nigeria has just been published. And most recently, a dual language adaptation of Our Bodies, Ourselves, which was the result of a rather amazing collaboration between Israeli and Palestinian, uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, Israeli and Palestinian peace building initiative called Women and Their Bodies. So that appeared last year. Mo more translation projects are in the make or waiting for funds to get started. For example, just to name a few, a Portuguese version for Brazil, a Turkish Our Bodies Ourselves, an adaptation for Tanzania, and an adaptation of the Tibetan version in Nepali. As I said at the beginning, the end really is nowhere in sight. So the first question that this trajectory raises is, of course, why did Our Bodies Ourselves travel this way? When the first translations appeared, the feminist movement was in full swing in Europe. There was a great demand for translations of US feminist books throughout Europe, although less in the other direction. Our Bodies Ourselves was part of this flurry of translations of US feminist books. Many European publishing houses were only too eager to publish what had already been a successful bestseller in the United States. That the book began moving farther afield had to do with several developments. First, an international women's movement was developing. International conferences had been held um, uh, throughout the 70s and 80s in Mexico City, Rome, Nairobi, Costa Rica, and Cairo. The Boston Women's Health Book Collective attended these conferences and spoke with health activists from other countries and made contact with women's groups interested in translating our bodies ourselves. Second, the Boston Women's Health Book Collective had from the early 70s on used the royalties from the book to send free copies of Our Bodies Ourselves to clinics and women's groups both within and outside the United States. Copies of the book also seemed to travel in someone's backpack and to turn up mysteriously in unexpected places. I've heard many stories from women who took copies of Our Bodies Ourselves on their travels and left them, for example, in a village clinic in rural Mexico, or a doctor's office in Burma, or a nunnery for refugee Tibetan nuns in Ladakh, which was the beginning of that translation story. But the most important factor for the trajectory of our bodies ourselves has to do with just plain economics. Foreign publishers were increasingly reluctant to take on the translation of what had become a very large book. By 1984, the US book had nearly doubled in size from 376 pages in 1976 to 625 pages in 1984. <coughs> Particularly for less affluent countries, publishing and distributing such an opus presented innumerable, insurmountable problems. So by the mid-90s, translations were not being taken on by publishers unless the projects were already subsidized. Thus, nearly all the later translation projects were supported by international foundations like Ford, Soros Open Society Institute, or the Global Fund for Women. This involved a collaboration between local women's groups composed of feminist activists, health providers, women's study scholars, and translators, and the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, who provided practical advice, help in networking, and help in writing funding proposals. Even with funding, however, the obstacles for these translation projects were still daunting. These obstacles ranged from power outages, shortages in paper, computers, printers, insufficient travel funds, to more dramatically Publish house, publishing houses going bankrupt, general economic crises, and conflict situations. 
These foundation-based projects were different in other ways from the earlier projects. They could not always assume that their audience would be able to read the book, let alone buy it. They also lacked funds for printing and distributing the book on a mass scale. For these reasons, many projects intended the books to be used in group settings as an educational resource. In fact, these later translation projects resembled the original stenciled version of Our Bodies Ourselves in its pre-publication days, when it was primarily a resource for groups of women to talk about their bodies and healthcare issues. You could say that through the translations, the history of Our Bodies Ourselves had come full swing. Our Bodies Ourselves did not, of course, stay the same as it traveled around the world. So what happened to it in the course of being translated and adapted? What was taken on board and what was left behind? So far, I've been using the term translation somewhat indiscriminately to describe the foreign editions of our bodies ourselves. Obviously, if you define translation as a faithful copy of the original, then these foreign editions were not, strictly speaking, translations. However, many translation scholars would argue today that translations are never perfect renditions of the original anyway. Translations invariably involve a re-articulation or reworking of the original depending on the needs, histories, and geopolitical context of a new audience. I'm therefore going to borrow the feminist scholar Anna Lowenhout Singh's definition of translations as faithless appropriations, <laughs> which I think perfectly describes what has happened in the translation of our bodies ourselves. While none of the translations were faithful copies, some limited their betrayal of the original to an occasional explanatory footnote or to adding new topics relevant to the local context, or writing a new introductory chapter. They almost always substituted photographs of local women and added references to local health services or women's organizations. But in some cases, the translators decided that, that the US, our bodies ourselves, was simply too US American for the local audience. This was the case. This was the case, for example, with the Arabic version called, translated, Women's Lives and Health in Egypt, which was published in 1991. The group, who called themselves the Cairo Women's Health Book Collective, after, as they put it at that time, our US sisters, decided early on that our bodies ourselves belonged to a cultural context alien to most Egyptian and Arab women and that it reflected the priorities of American women. Since they wanted to produce a book which would take the Egyptian and Arab cultural context into account and emphasize the problems facing women in the Arab world, they decided to write their own book, a book which was inspired by Our Bodies Ourselves. While most of the translations, including the inspired versions, remain fairly loyal to the general political philosophy and methodology of the US Our Bodies Ourselves, the translators did not hesitate to deviate from the book in order to ensure that it would be oppositional in their local context. These transformations show not only how the oppositionality of a text depends upon the specific social, cultural, and geopolitical context in which it is received, but that what may be oppositional in one context it may not be so in another. Let me give you two examples as an illustration. In the early 1990s, the Spanish Our Bodies Ourselves, Nuestros Cuerpos, Nuestras Vidas, which had been used in the United States for Spanish-speaking communities, was adapted for a broader audience in Latin America. This ambitious project was undertaken as a collaboration between US Latinas and feminist health activists from Peru, 
Puerto Rico, Colombia, Chile, Cuba, Venezuela, El Salvador, and Mexico. This new translation adaptation took more than 10 years to complete, that should come as no surprise, and involved a major overhaul of our bodies ourselves, including changing the order of chapters, politics to the front, body image to the back, adding chapters on religion and traditional healing. As one of the editors told me, Kathy, you can't have a book for Latinas without even mentioning the Catholic Church. <laughs> and generally making the book more explicitly political. The participants in this project wanted to create a book which would speak to Latinas within and outside the United States. The trans this tra translation project was less about the book than about the shared projects that the book made possible. The participants of the, trans of the translation project wanted to use the translation of Our Bodies Ourselves to build transnational alliances around women's health issues between a growing Latina movement in the United States and the long-standing, vibrant women's movements throughout Latin America, South America, and the Caribbean. To this end, they focused on cultural similarities which they believed could link Latinas from the North and the South. The importance of family and community, religion and spirituality, and a politics of social justice, which included, but was not limited to gender. They highlighted the shared historical legacy of US imperialistic interventions and emphasized their differences with the consumerist culture in the United States. Nuestros cuerpos, nuestras vidas rejected what the translators saw as the individualism of the US, our bodies, ourselves, with its focus on individual women's bodies and health problems, and the importance of consciousness raising and self-help. Instead, they advocated family connections, community support, and collective political activism against poverty, racism, and imperialism as the sine qua non for women's health and feminist health politics. I will now turn to a very different translation story. The Bulgarian translation of Our Bodies, Ourselves, which was published in 2001. This translation was undertaken in the wake of the democratization processes which emerged after 1989 brought an end to Soviet control. After a long period of equality dictated by the state, independent women's groups began to spring up all over Bulgaria, but they also met with considerable resistance. <laughs> Feminism was associated either with the old collectivist ideology of the socialist regime, equality through work and more work, or with Western-style feminism associated with stereotypes of man-hating anti-family lesbians. Add to this a passivity fostered by a long period of state patriarchy, and it is clear that the Bulgarian feminists had their work cut out for them. They needed to find ways to generate a gender awareness and mobilize women to become active political subjects without setting off alarms about the return of collectivist ideologies. In this context, the Bulgarian translators of Our Bodies, Ourselves adopted a very different strategy than their Latin American counterparts. They embraced the very individualism which the Latina project had rejected <coughs> and re-articulated it into a first step toward gendered citizenship making it oppositional in the post-socialist Bulgarian context. For example, they used Our Bodies, Ourselves to urge readers who were likely to put their families first to take care of themselves. They emphasized women as individuals and advocated a personal relationship to one's body. For the overburdened woman, exhausted from the daily struggle of having to make ends meet, and dependent upon her family for survival, an image was provided which was not anti-family, yet nevertheless encouraged her to think about herself as an individual with needs and rights. 
they were careful to avoid the term feminism, the F word, or anything which sounded like an ideology or a collective movement. Instead, they spoke of using the book to engage in a dialogue. They made explicit that the book was an ongoing project to which they hoped the readers would contribute their own experiences and opinions. Now, as you can see, both the Latin American and the Bulgarian translations of Our Bodies, Ourselves borrowed selectively from the US text. They re-articulated the text very differently and in ways that would make it oppositional in their specific local and geopolitical context. Taken together, they show that what is oppositional in one context is not necessarily so in another. So having looked briefly at um, some of the translation projects, I've now come to the end of my talk. At the beginning, I said that the travels of our bodies ourselves compelled me to drop my original intention to write a straightforward history of the book and the group that originally made it. The focus of my inquiry shifted instead to our bodies ourselves as a kind of feminist traveling theory, as a site for exploring how ideas circulate and in the process become transformed. I will now conclude with some of the implications of this shift in perspective for how we could think about feminist history, for the circulation of feminist ideas and knowledge and knowledge practices, and for the possibilities of transnational political alliances. Now, when I um, finished my book, um, I, was, uh, I was quite hopeful about the direction that our bodies ourselves had taken. As someone who is used to doing feminist research, I'm, uh, I, 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 I find myself being fairly critical and jaundiced about the world around me. And I found this a very positive uh, story that um, uh, made me quite optimistic. Unfortunately, several years later, um, I feel that I'm going to have to temper some of this initial optimism with a cautionary note. <laughs> so for the, those of you who read my book with a, kind of a warm, feel-good feeling at the end, <laughs> I'm going to disappoint you just a bit. <laughs> um, OK, let me start with uh, some of the implications that this project um, has for how we think about feminist history and writing feminist history. Um, in recent years, U.S. feminist historians, and I might add feminist historians in Western Europe as well, have devoted considerable attention to what is often called the second wave of feminism. Some of these histories are written with an unmistakable nostalgia for the good old days, while others are more critical, pointing to the mistakes and failings of those early years. But in either case, feminism is treated as something which has come and gone, leaving us with no other choice than to patiently await the next wave, a new generation who will pick up the torch and carry on where we left off. The history of our bodies ourselves disrupts the notion that feminism is a thing of the past. Here I want to show you one of my favorite photographs. This, this photograph appeared in the 2000 edition of Nuestros Cuerpos Nuestras Vidas. It shows Maria Skinner, who was a longtime member of Amigas Latinas and Acción por Salud, the group of US Latinas who helped make the Spanish Our Bodies Ourselves for Latin America. You see her here holding up the very first edition of Our Bodies Ourselves. I especially like this image because of what it tells us about feminist history. It shows that the history of Our Bodies Ourselves is not just a history of the original US collective but that it belongs to women like Maria Skinner, who read, used, or translated the book. It shows that the history of our bodies ourselves did not stop in the 70s, or in the 90s, or even in 2011, but that it extends well beyond the US across the globe. Contrary to some contemporary feminist histo historiographies, the international trajectory of our bodies ourselves suggests that feminism is very much alive and kicking, albeit in different configurations and in different locations. Feminism is not limited to the United States and indeed may presently 
play a more significant role outside the United States. Thus, the notion that the second wave is over and that feminism is dead begins to look like a bad case of ethnocentric myopia, the failure of US feminism to look beyond its own backyard. It may be time instead to develop what the feminist scholar Susan Stanford Friedman has called some geographical imagination, and for historians to start tracking the migratory and transcultural formations feminism has taken and continues to take. The global dissemination of our bodies ourselves begs us to think geographically. And when we do this, feminism becomes visible as both ubiquitously global and specifically local. This, I would argue, is more reason for optimism than for despair. So this brings me to my second point. Uh, the making of our bodies and ourselves and its travels have implications for how we should think about knowledge and knowledge politics. This photograph, and it was the photograph I used for the cover of my book, shows a group of women in Tamil Nadu who are activists working on issues of illiteracy and women's health. One of the founders of the Boston Women's Health, uh, you can see one of the founders of the Boston Women's Health Book Collective in the middle, um, it looks like she's sewing. I'm, I'm not quite sure if that's true, but. Um, and then you see the books, Um, that's the 1976 version of Our Bodies, Ourselves. And as you can see, the women in the group are getting ready to have a discussion about it when the photographer took the picture. I used this photograph for the cover of my book because it raised precisely the kinds of questions I wanted to address. How could a popular US feminist book end up so far away from home? Who are these women, and what do they think about the book? What does the presence of the book in this time and place say about how feminist knowledge crosses borders? Contemporary feminist scholarship has always acknowledged the importance of Our Bodies Ourselves as a popular book on women's health and the significance it has had for international feminist health politics. However, Our Bodies Ourselves is seldom regarded as having anything of importance to offer feminist theory. As one of the most important contemporary <coughs> postmodern feminist theorists has said, Donna Haraway, um, our bodies ourselves commit several cardinal theoretical sins. It naturalizes the female body. It valorizes women's experiences as a sor source of truth. And it glorifies the agency of autonomous individual women. So as, as those of you who are versed in feminist theory know, these are big no-nos. For postmodern feminist theory, this can only mean that our bodies ourselves is at best hopelessly naive and at worst in dire need of some critical deconstruction. It clearly does not have anything of theoretical relevance to offer contemporary feminist theory, which is firmly committed to ridding itself of what it regards as the unwanted baggage of Western Enlightenment philosophy. Now this deconstructive process has obviously been very important. It has also helped us to think critically about how global relations of power are reflected in the production and reception of feminist theory in the affluent first world. However, this overriding concern with deconstruction has also somewhat paradoxically diverted our attention from the transnational politics of knowledge on the ground. In other words, how does feminist knowledge actually travel? And what happens to it as it moves from location to location? And even more importantly, what makes a feminist traveling theory good? That is, when does it open, open up possibilities for critical reflection and when is it just another case of the US imposing itself on the rest of the world, a kind of feminist cultural imperialism? I would argue that feminist theory has much to learn from the travels of our bodies ourselves. Our bodies ourselves was able to travel 
so widely precisely because it was never just a popular book about women's health. Our Bodies, Ourselves was an epistemological project which invited differently embodied women to use their specific experiences to engage critically with the authoritative voice of medicine and to situate their health concerns in a broader social, cultural, and political context. It was this politics of knowledge which allowed the book to speak to women of different ethnicities, class backgrounds, sexual orientations, generations, and geographical locations. It invited them to use their own needs and experiences to read against the grain of the book. It invited readers to be critical of what they were reading. This politics of knowledge was integral to how Our Bodies, Ourselves was read, to how it was made and revised, and of course, to how it was translated and adapted. One of the most exciting things about the translation projects is that they show how feminist knowledge is taken up, rearticulated, and transformed by women across the globe in ways that make it equally, but very differently, oppositional. Our Bodies, Ourselves is not only a perfect example of what Edward Said has called traveling theory, but it is a traveling theory with a unique capacity of generating endless alternatives, which, when all is said and done, may well be what critical consciousness is all about. For those feminist theorists who are concerned with the hegemonic status of first world feminist scholarship, it may well be time to stop focusing on those theories which are most firmly embedded in the context that is being criticized, the academy or Western philosophy, and begin considering those theories which have demonstrated that they are capable of movement and transformation. For anyone interested in the possibilities of critical, non-imperialistic feminist theories on a global scale, a traveling theory like Our Bodies, Ourselves deserves our most serious attention. So in conclusion, the making of Our Bodies, Ourselves and how it traveled has implications for how we might think about transnational feminist practice. U.S. feminism has always had an ideological commitment to internationalism. Robin Morgan's well-known opus, Sisterhood is Global, provided a popular vision of international feminist solidarity based on a shared gender identity and experience of oppression, which presumably transcended national borders. However well-intentioned this was, um, it's a version of international uh, feminism which has been heavily criticized by many feminist scholars, including Chandra Mohanty, Gayatri Spivak, Interpol Grable, and many more. They regard global feminism as a euphemism for what is, in actuality, a US version of feminism. A version of feminism marred by an arrogant universalism and a tendency to treat non-Western women as victims in need of rescue by their already emancipated sisters in the West. This kind of feminism not only smacks of colonialist missionary work, but it denies the agency of non-Western women as well as long-standing traditions of feminist struggle outside the United States. These critics have argued that a truly transnational feminism would focus on differences among women rather than shared identity. It would acknowledge that even feminist alliances are infused with inequalities of power, and that feminists are always complicit with their national histories of slavery, imperialism, genocide, or colonialism. And last but not least, it would decenter US feminism as just one feminism among many. Our Bodies, Ourselves is important for feminist politics because it offers a test case for how transnational alliances actually take shape. It is my contention that by looking at how feminists actually work across lines of difference in the course of making and disseminating Our Bodies, Ourselves, some of the crit critique of global feminism can be tempered 
with a more realistic and grounded perspective on transnational feminist politics. Okay, now here is the, the, the positive side. <laughs> the translations of Our Bodies Ourselves have, indeed, potentially decentered Our Bodies Ourselves as a US feminist project by moving the US to the supportive position of facilitator while the translation project become, in some ways, the movers and the shakers, the place where everything is happening. Translations invariably entail the acknowledgement of differences among women and of finding ways to make our bodies ourselves speak across these differences. The encounters among feminists across borders which are engendered through our bodies ourselves and its translations provide a glimpse of the kind of dialogues which are possible when differently situated women work together on issues of concern to them all. Whether these dialogues will ultimately create a truly transnational feminism, one which is critically reflexive and mutually empowering, is an open question. And it is here that I would like to add a cautionary note. Um, this photograph um, was taken um, from a symposium <coughs> celebrating 40 years of our bodies ourselves, which was recently held in Boston in October 2011. I attended this conference. Um, you could see many of the translators and global partners who have come up on this stage to take a bow. On the one hand, this was an exhilarating conference because it showed how far our bodies ourselves had traveled and how, in, how enormously important the book has been to women across the globe. The stories of these projects were inspiring and often even amazing. Despite, or pre, perhaps because of the often enormous obstacles which they had to face in translating the book, um, the projects gave everyone at the symposium reason to feel hopeful about feminism. At the same time, the symposium left many of us um, feeling slightly uneasy. Despite the attention given to the translation projects, the framing of Our Bodies Ourselves was still very much a US American story and a US American feminist project. The symposium began with the familiar story of the origins of Our Bodies Ourselves in Boston, and it ended with a nostalgic and very backward looking look at US feminist activism in the 70s when presumably everything was wonderful. <laughs> in this way, these translation projects, which had been given a lot of attention in the middle of the symposium, were reduced to merely interesting and of course very heartwarming spin-offs of what was the main concern of the day, namely US feminism. This was, I think, more than just an oversight or a missed opportunity. It also signaled one of the most intractable problems within feminism today. What the organizers of the symposium failed to initiate were real dialogues across borders. Dialogues which would have allowed what the philosopher Maria Lugones has called world traveling. World traveling is a prerequisite for a truly transnational feminism. It refers to the process of entering another person's world, learning what it is to be them, learning what it is to be ourselves in their eyes, and in this way beginning to become subjects for one another. If this is our goal, and I believe that it should be, there it seems, it seems to me that our work has only just begun. Thank you.
this project indicates that issues that have to do with bodies and health, um, I, don't, I don't like to use the term you know, a universal issue, but it's certainly an issue that resonates with, with, with many, many women across the globe. Um, for example, the World Forum chose body as one of, one of the central issues uh, to, be, to, to be discussed. So I think you know, there are issues that are, um, uh, are of concern for, 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 for many, many women, but how this plays out and the ways that they are interesting uh, and that they're important um, are very different depending on the local context. And of course, these conversations are conversations which are important to have. beginning you talked a little bit about your original project uh, and part of that wanting to do, to do some oral histories with um, some of the original women from Our Bodies Ourselves. Um, were you able to conduct any oral histories? Um, and I'm kind of curious if you were able, did you do any with um, women who received translations of Our Bodies Ourselves? Yeah. Um, that, uh, this is one of the reasons why this project took so long <laughs> to complete. I began the project doing oral histories with the founders of uh, the Boston Women's Health Book Collective. So in fact, I did oral histories with all of them, and they can be found in, they're available in the library. Um, however, in the process of doing this research, um, I just, I, I found out about the translations, and I thought, you know, this, if I'm going to tell the story about this book, this is a story that um, um, I need to tell. And uh, so I sort of, just, the, the, um, um, decided not to do this original project of, of writing a, a history based on these oral histories. Um, however, in my book, I, I uh, include some of this material. Um, with the translators, I, um, um, I interviewed many of the translators, obviously all of the translators. Um, um, I went to meetings where the translators uh, came to discuss some of the problems doing the translation. So I, I attended these meetings and talked to them at the meetings. Um, in some cases, the translators had written um, uh, prefaces to their books where they described this, the arduous process of translating the book, so I used some of that material. So it was very much kind of putting together material from different sources. I had a lot of help. Um, from people who spoke different languages um, um, going through the books and discovering some of the differences. So it was a, it was a huge project. I'd, I'd like to follow up on that because um, I, I keep thinking about translation and what it means to, to, to translate and the world view that, that arises out of this translation or the translation arises out of the world view. Um, can you be, can you focus on uh, what some of those difficulties were, very specifically, what kinds of issues made translation most difficult for various people? Um, I'll give a couple of examples. No, I realize <laughs> um, that. Sometimes it was a matter of language. Um, for, for those of you who have read Our Bodies Ourselves, you know that it speaks to the reader as you and kind of invites the reader to think about her own body as she's reading the book. That's one of the way, ways that the text is so effective. But some languages don't have that kind of language. They don't have, uh, they don't, it's impossible to address the reader linguistically in the same way. Um, another problem is they didn't have language to talk about women's bodies. So some of the translation projects, for example, the Japanese translation, um, developed a whole new language, a positive language for talking about women's body parts. And one of the, one of, one of the, 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 this is a success story, some of the, the terms that they developed for talking about women, women's bodies now appear in Japanese dictionaries. So they, uh, that, that was another problem. Sometimes the problem was that um, some of the information in our bodies ourselves just didn't, um, it, uh, it, it didn't translate into another context. For example, some of the medications weren't available in, um, in, in, in another context. Or information about nutrition um, translates cynically in a context where people have, have um, major problems even feeding themselves. Um, so there were all kinds of, <laughs> all kinds of problems. <laughs> 
along the same line, I'm wondering about the chapter on lesbianism. I own the second edition of the book published in 1973, and I was coming out about that time. Mm -hmm. um, and the book was incredibly important to me as a lesbian um, and knowing that I wasn't alone. So I wondered if that chapter, a chapter like that, has been included in the other translations. That's a very good, that's a very good uh, comment. Um, in the beginning, um, uh, the Boston Women's Health Book Collective, when the book was translated, they insisted, um, and this is when the book was being published by publishing companies, they insisted that, uh, that all of the chapters be included in some form or another in the translation, precisely because there were three issues that were constantly being um, censored, and one was the, the, the chapter on lesbians, the other was masturbation and abortion. Those three topics were always in danger. Um, later, um, as the, the, the translation projects moved further afield, they were much less hands-on in terms of the content, and they left decisions about the content to the groups that were um, uh, doing the translations, partly because they were facing such um, um, enormous censorship issues that they, um, they well, they, they felt that they had to respect what they could, what they could, what they felt they could put in the book or not. Uh, this doesn't really have to do with translations, but um, I remember I have I think three or maybe four editions of Our Bodies Ourselves, and the Our Bodies Ourselves was one of the first places I learned about gender mutilation, um, and so and that was probably. I think that was a red cover. Um, so it started looking at women's health issues from around the world, but yes, in a very victimization kind of way. And I'm wondering, is it still, I haven't looked at it since about 1997, and I'm wondering if it still does that sort of, in the US edition. Yes, uh, that, uh, that uh, general um, um, mutilation, or uh, I, uh, I think that's not the term that's used, but, um, uh, it is mentioned in the um, in the U.S. version, but what's interesting about that is that it's framed quite differently um, in the U.S. version. Uh, it's framed, for example, in um, in the Egyptian um, uh, "Our Bodies Ourselves." And the the Egyptian um, um, uh, collective had a had a, a long dis a discussion about how to frame this issue, and they disagreed with the the U.S. group that was treating it as a as a form of sexual violence. So they wanted to. They, they, uh, 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 um, so they put. They they had it more as a problem with socialization. And, uh, so they had a completely different framing of it. So because it just seems that that would be a Robin Morgan kind of thing, like the sisterhood is global. Therefore, all of this is bad. And yeah. Well, but, but that's a good. That's a good example of an issue that is. It has. Uh, um, it's 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 very widespread, but it, it can be framed in different ways. That is a, that's a very good question, and uh, it's, it, it, it seems to me that should always be a question which arises when you think about the circulation of um, our bodies ourselves. And the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, on the one hand, of course, it completely the, 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 the global circulation of our bodies ourselves completely changed uh, the U.S. version in the sense that the U.S. version is now made with uh, having that in mind that it's that it's going to be uh, disseminated in other places and used in, in other parts of the world um, and certainly the US version is is much more attentive to um, um, the fact that the, the the women's health movement is a, is, a, is a global movement so there's a lot of attention paid to that um, what doesn't um, uh, what doesn't return and I think should return is this the, 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 the lessons that can be learned from some of these translation projects, this idea that you that you get together to start from scratch, what, what, would, what would make sense, what kind of book would make, would make sense in a new context. And I think the US book is very much, is much more tied to kind of the original version that needs to be um, updated. And that's, that, that's too bad because the, 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 the translations are, are extremely creative and, 
in, in, in developing new uh, new responses to uh, to women's bodies and health issues. Um, well, I was just sort of interested in, in the current day, women's bodies and women's health has become a political issue again. And I was wondering what you think our bodies ourselves place in this discussion is and how what we've learned through the translations can sort of help us continue to contribute to that discussion. Um, I'm not sure how to answer this. <laughs> Um, what 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 uh, what what we can learn from the translations for discussions here about um, about women's women's bodies and health? Well, I mean, one of the things uh, uh, what what I was just talking about, I think, um, what was what's so interesting about the about the translations is that, that they um, that they take um, uh, they they take a text and and they use the text uh, to have conversations about. Um, which issues are important and how they need to be addressed, and what what would be an oppositional body politics in a particular context? And I think, um, um, obviously, um, uh, in the United States, where where uh, there are lots of body issues that are that are extremely uh, crucial, they need to be addressed. Um, um, it's a it, 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 this kind of process would be uh, important. In the, in the, um the ones that are developing now, like you mentioned Tanzania, was in the process of coming up with a new translation. Are you finding in the newly emergent ones that there are new transnational collaborations? For example, is the Tanzanian Collective looking to some of the other recently um, emergent trans translation communities, or are they working primarily amongst their, within their own national borders? Um, no, actually, it, it's very interesting. Many of the translations are, um, there are also spin-offs of translations. So some, uh, some of the projects look to other translations for their inspiration um, before they look to the, uh, to the United States. And many, well, one, of the thing, one of the interesting um, aspects of these uh, translations is that the networks that they generate, and um, many of the translators see these networks as much more important than, than the, the actual book. The book is really the least of the least of it. The, 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 what's important are the, the networks, the activities that are generated around the books, and um, and these definitely cross uh, national borders. So that's clearly one of the possibilities. Then. Yeah. yeah. I think there was maybe one more question. I was just wondering if it would be if it's disheartening to women around the globe to look at the United States and see that there are issues coming up here that we saw we felt were solved. And how women around the world would uh, react to that and maybe be disheartened. <laughs> yes, that's a, that's a very nice comment. Uh, uh, absolutely. And before, I'll give you an example from the Bulgarian uh, translation that they, they, they have quite a long passage about the, um, the, the, the struggles around abortion in the United States. Not because they need that information; their 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 situation is very very different. But they use it as a in in, in a sense as a cautionary story. We don't have that problem here, but they do. And <laughs> <laughs> it goes around, comes around. <laughs> Please join me in thanking.